Hello everyone, and thank you for joining the third week of the Signal Center's Accessibility Awareness Series. Signal Centers is located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, a gig city on the Tennessee River and ranked as one of 2019's top 100 places to live in America. Signal Centers provides technology, accommodations, and training to help individuals with disabilities live their best lives. Here is CEO Donna McConico. Hi, I'm Donna McConico. Welcome to the Signal Center's Accessibility Awareness Summit. Last year at our very first summit, our keynote speaker, Haben Gurma, said this, the problem is never the disability. She was right. We are living in the midst of a technology renaissance and we must be the leaders insisting that this movement is for all. Accessibility is within our reach and it will take persistence and creativity to fully embrace all of the possibilities that technology offers for individuals with disabilities. Thank you for joining us again this year to continue the conversation about accessibility. This webinar series would not be possible without the support of our partner and host, Chattanooga State Community College. With an enrollment of more than 8,000 students, Chattanooga State offers more than 100 degree plans. Its digital accessibility mission statement is a commitment to provide all individuals the opportunity to use technologies. Here is Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Beth Norton. Chattanooga State hopes this conference series will inspire transformative conversations about the inclusion of all individuals in the ever-changing world of digital technology. Signal Centers is grateful to the following sponsors. Unum, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, Phil Hour, Electric Power Board, Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities, AT&T, and a special thank you to McKee Foods for sponsoring today's sessions. It started a long, long time ago. Little Debbie's granddad woke up and said, You know, I think I'll make the world a treat. A fresh from the oven, something sweet. The face of Little Debbie will go with each one. As my granddaughter's the vision of freshness and fun. And through the years and generations, we've served up smiles and innovations. Oatmeal cream pies. Swiss rolls galore, zebra cakes, Nutty Buddy, Honey Bun, and more. We make them and whoosh, they rush to your store for the smiles they bring you and the difference that makes. That's the reason this family bakery does what it takes. And each morning when we awake, we look in the mirror. Today, we bake. And now, in recognition of Global Accessibility Awareness Day, Voice Technology and Accessibility, with Bradley Metrock, CEO of Nashville-based Score Publishing, founder of the podcast network Voice First FM, and host of the show This Week in Voice. Wesley, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Signal Centers. Uh, what a great program you put together. After that intro, I feel like I ought to be eating a uh, oatmeal cream pie. <laughs> I don't know if that was strategic to to put that on beforehand and get me uh, get me hungry, but uh, it it worked. Uh, my name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of a company called Score Publishing, based in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we are not a normal publisher. A lot of what we do puts us at the center of the conversation around voice technology and what's called conversational AI, which sits underneath that. What I want to do in this presentation is paint you a picture of where voice technology has come and what looks like it's on the immediate horizon. And uh, I'll start by telling you a little bit about me just to kick this thing off. It'll be brief. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the competitive landscape in voice and AI now, uh, because that plays a big role in 
facilitating accessibility across all of these voice assistants and smart speakers that you see. Then I'm going to walk a number of use cases that uh, underscore just how far we've come. <clears throat> and a lot of fascinating. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the future and then we'll open up for Q&A. So thank you for being here. Thank you for Signal Centers. Thank you for all the sponsors involved. Appreciate all y'all. So I'm going to start my presentation here. Oh, let me go back. Okay, let me click share screen. Okay. And now I'm going to hit play from start. Okay, so this is the cover slide. Um, I'm going to just explain myself very briefly. Voice First FM, I started this podcast network three years ago. Uh, a lot of different shows touching on a lot of different aspects of voice and AI. Today, Voice First FM is listened to across 56 countries by hundreds of thousands of people, predominantly technology professionals. This Week in Voice is our flagship show. I host it myself. You might recognize this guy. He was our guest on the season finale a couple of seasons ago. Uh, I wrote this article for Harvard Business Review. Your company needs a strategy for voice technology. Check this out if you find anything in this presentation even remotely interesting. This is me. I'm... I was recognized as a top influencer in voice. I still can't figure out if that's an insult or a compliment. Uh, we do a lot of events over the course of the year. The Voice of Healthcare Summit is coming up at Harvard. Uh, we talk about voice in the car. It's a totally different animal. Uh, Mercedes is a big part of that. Digital book world uh, is a longstanding publishing event. The Voice of Money is all about voice technology and conversational AI and modern banking and finance. And the big one, is Project Voice, which is the number one event in this space. And guess where this takes place? Chattanooga, Tennessee. And we couldn't be more proud of that. Uh, this past January, Project Voice took place and Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Samsung were all presenting sponsors, as well as I might add EPB, which is a sponsor of this program you're watching right now. Project Voice Catalyst is a program that we put together which guides businesses and organizations through uh, using uh, voice technology and AI in their business to further uh, their own development. If you're interested in that at all, uh, we can talk. So that tells you a little bit about who I am and what we do. So now everybody's familiar with this, uh, the Echo Dot, all of Amazon's products, all of Google's products, you see smart speakers everywhere he's well, talking to your phone doing doing this um voices all around us and it's worth sort of talking for a moment about how we got here the perception is that late 2016 early 2017 amazon rolled out alexa and things just took off ma magically <laughs> but like every story that is an overnight success, uh, seemingly an overnight success. Uh, it started a long time before that, uh, in a in a really not glamorous way, that uh, that then built up over time to allow that overnight success sort of moment to occur. There are fantastic people all across the world who have been involved with speech recognition, natural language processing, and understanding um, all sorts of core technologies that lent themselves to the birth of Amazon Alexa a couple of years ago. And uh, when you talk to these people about what's happening, they're just blown away that the technology has been adopted to the extent that it has. Once Alexa came out in late 2016, early 2017, they took advantage of the fact that they had this precious real estate on their website to sell a gazillion echoes. And you saw everybody, you know, a lot of people with the smart speakers on uh, kitchen tables, uh, bathroom counters, uh, they started becoming ubiquitous. And it's worth noting that uh, there's a lot of folks who see what has happened with voice and they lament the privacy issues related to it. You know, it's that's something that we're going to struggle with from here on out. You're not going to see me talk about privacy much in this presentation, although privacy is a huge issue that uh, anybody in this space deals with. It's not going anywhere. Uh, families and individuals have to make their own decisions on whether this technology is right for them. 
And if you if you think about uh, what would have happened if a company like Facebook came out with the first voice assistant and smart speaker, uh, it would have been very different because people don't trust Facebook. And there's plenty of other companies I could name that they don't trust either. Amazon, the good thing about them was they had built up a reputation for being a customer-centric company. And they had built up a lot of brand equity around the concept that they go to bat for the customer. They'll run businesses out of business just to lower something for by two cents for the customer or to get that widget to you, you know, three hours quicker. And uh, that has paid off royally with rolling out voice technology. Um, people have accepted putting these things in their home in a way that they would not have if another company had done it. So all of that to say, that sort of brings us to this point where, where uh, I'll walk you through some, some uh, concepts of where we are with voice and some key use cases. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation. So a term that you will hear me use and many others use is voice first. And I wanna explain what this means. The thing about voice technology that makes it so special is it, it is so innately human. When we're born and when we're in the womb, all we have is our mother's voice. And as we grow up, we develop an inner voice that guides us for the rest of our lives. So it always stood to reason that as technology evolves over time, it would arc toward being voice driven, voice oriented, what we call voice first. So obviously because of that, voice and accessibility are pretty inextricably linked. And I wanna just post this here. This is the definition of accessibility that information I found online, and I think it really helps frame this conversation. Accessibility means that people can do what they need to do in a similar amount of time and effort as someone who does not have a disability. It means that people are empowered, can be independent, and will not be frustrated by something that is poorly designed or implemented. And what we've seen from voice so far is that, uh, oh, my head stopped sharing, there we go. What we've seen from voice so far is that uh, it's taken a little bit of time, but the speech recognition has gotten so good that um, you know, even a couple of years ago, it was about a 90, 95% level and human beings are about between 95 and 98%. Uh, and now uh, Alexa and Google Assistant are about at that same level, in some cases a little bit better. So it's uh, pretty cool to think about voice from the standpoint of opening up computing to all sorts of folks who have physical, mental challenges, whatever it is that makes it less accessible to them. And with voice being a new interface, a new means of engaging with technology, technology then becomes open to many more people. So I'm gonna go back to this. So I wanna talk about this slide for just a moment. Um, and if you're interested in any of what I'm saying, you'll wanna check out a website called voicebot.ai. That's V-O-I-C-E-B-O-T.ai. So this uh, graphic that you're looking at came from that site. It's a very well-known news and commentary site in the space. So when you look at 2019, you see Amazon has a pretty well-defined market lead. They're the clear number one player. If you if if this graph uh, if this graphic showed 2018, Amazon's lead would be even greater. What has happened is that through a combination of things, I'm not going to really dwell on in this presentation. Google has caught up, and uh, to the point now where Amazon, um, you know, Amazon's lead is just you know, Amazon sits at about half of uh, smart speaker market share in the United States. And Google has caught up to such an extent that it's pretty much a, uh, it's pretty much a duopoly at this point. And that's relevant for 
a very important reason. When Alexa rolled out in 2017, what you got from an accessibility standpoint was whatever Amazon decided to give you. Now, with Amazon and Google really squaring up to, to be head-to-head -head competitors in this space, what you're going to see with accessibility-oriented concepts and topics, as well as many other things, is uh, a lot greater urgency to adopt new features and functionality. And, and it's that all those benefits of competition come into the space. If all we had is, uh, if all, all we had is little in the marketplace, then we'd have only have the snacks that they decided to make. But because little De Debbie has competition from a lot of different other people, they're constantly working to make their snacks as good as they possibly be. And I'm sure they appreciate me mentioning them as a sponsor of this. But uh, competition fuels everything. And really, for the first time since Alexa rolled out, we are true, had true competition from two worthy players in the space. So that is a very important thing to note. If you don't note anything else from this presentation, that's a good thing to take away. So now I'm going to talk about use cases. And uh, I'm going to go one by one through these. And this you'll see this slide a bunch, uh, so you don't have to feel like you need to write this down. And, and for signal centers, uh, I'll make this slide deck available for whoever wants it afterward. So the first use case here is novel effect. And I want to talk about this. So novel effect was the first company that the Amazon Alexa and Techstars incubator allowed to come into their program. Uh, they went on Shark Tank and got a $250,000 offer, which they rejected in the process of going on to raise $3.5 million. So what do they do? They, they have created technology that works with voice as well as there's a mobile app. And essentially what it does is it listens to when one human being reads a story or, or a book to another human being. Um, and a lot of the, the main use case here is for children. So if I'm reading our son, who's eight years old, The Cat in the Hat, Novel Effects technology will hear me reading Cat in the Hat to our son, and it will detect, oh, okay, you're in chapter four, and we know right where you are, and it will match up this uh, custom-made soundscape, many of which are recorded in Nashville, uh, I might add, um, to the live reading human to human of the book. And that sounds like a gimmick, but what they have found out and what several others have found out who are associated with the company is that when you combine this audio soundscape to one human being reading a book to another human being, reading comprehension explodes. And so there's a lot of educational implications for what Novel Effect has put together. And they're just beginning to find out what all of them are. It's a, it's a fantastic company, and we were fortunate to have gotten to know them well. Stephen King Library. So I'll talk about that a second. So the Stephen King Library is a publishing industry example of voice technology. And it really is one of the best examples of a glimpse into the future of what AI will bring us. So what the Stephen King Library does, it's on Alexa, and I believe it's on Google Assistant as well at this point, is it will ask you for the most recent Stephen King book that you've read. Stephen King's written, I think, between 50 and 60 books over his life. So it'll ask you the most recent Stephen King book that, that you've read, uh, if there is one. And then it'll start asking you some other questions that may seem unrelated. And uh, then it will, uh, as, it, as its ultimate output, tell you, here's a list, you know, one, two, three of the next Stephen King books that you ought to consider and read. And, and I also believe you can buy them through the Alexa skill. Alexa skill, by the way, is just Amazon's name for an app made available through Alexa. So uh, it is a means of discovering new books from the information of books you've read and things you're interested in. And uh, it's fascinating what uh, Simon and & Schuster and Skill Creative, which is an agency out of New York City, have put together with this. Encourage you to check it out. I think it's a great glimpse to the future. 
Um, the next example of an early success is Alexa, what am I holding? And this one in particular um, is one that I always talk about. Um, so if you have seen an Echo Show or uh, any of the Echo, uh, Amazon Echo devices that have a front facing camera, you can go up to those devices and say, Alexa, what am I holding? So if I, I go up to an Echo Show and I say, Alexa, what am I holding? This is a product, it's got a barcode. So it will scan the barcode and it will figure out what this thing is and it will tell you what it is. And then if you wanna order it through Amazon, if you can, if they've got it in stock or whatever, if they carry it, you could order it through them. If it's something that does not have a barcode, then it will attempt to use some algorithms and machine learning to tell you what this is. And it's actually pretty good at it, um, but not nearly as good as if it has a barcode. So again, sounds like a gimmick, sounds like Amazon wants to sell some stuff, and, and trust me, they do, but it's really useful for people who have no vision, low vision, and a number of other accessibility sort of scenarios. In fact, it's, it's transformative. So, and, and by itself is a reason to buy one of these devices. Um, there's been many situations I've been made aware of, of people in senior living facilities or uh, elderly folks living by themselves who make use of this function all the time. And um, it's incredibly powerful. And so if you're thinking about accessibility, you're thinking about voice, a prime use case. That, um, that illustrates just the power of the technology, even already, uh, even already. So the next example is Alexa Guard. I'm gonna co cover a couple of these more quickly so I can spend more time with the ones at the end. Alexa Guard is a technology built into Alexa where Alexa and Echo devices will listen to your environment. And they will, um, you know, you put it in your house, so it'll it'll listen and it'll say, okay, um, the refrigerator opens 2.7 times a day. Um, we're used to this low level of volume in here. Um, people are walking around on average from 6.49 a.m. to 9.02 p.m. You know, it'll, it'll do some baselining. And then if it hears something, Thing that it is not used to hearing, like a glass, like a window breaking, or if it doesn't hear any activity for a while when it's used to hearing it, then it will make a call to um, whoever you designate. It might call the authorities. It might do, do a lot of things. This is a critical um, use case for insurance. Uh, you're seeing insurance get all over this. Um, uh, healthcare and telehealth health is all over this. Uh, it's a very good um, story uh, that sort of illustrates um, accessibility-minded uses of, of voice. I'm going to mention Google Recorder as well. Google Recorder is simply a audio recording app. But the thing about Google Recorder that makes it different is that it transcribes your text in real time. And here's Sketch with no cloud. So no cloud, no internet connection, it transcribes and tune will translate text from audio that you record. And this has opened up a lot of different use cases, many of which are accessibility first sort of scenarios um, in rural uh, country areas, uh, areas where internet is uh, harder to, to come by. And um, it's it's really a under the radar win for Google and, and something to keep an eye on. I'm gonna spend my time on these last three. And uh, this next one is smart speakers and college freshmen and senior citizens. So I'm gonna take my, put the camera back on here. So it's interesting that we live in this so-called information age. We're surrounded by technology. And yet, 
we're more depressed, isolated, and lonely than we ever have been before. There's many people who think that, you know, just, and I'm talking to across humanity. And even with that, there's two types of people that get more depressed and lonely than everybody else, according to the data that we have. And those two types of people are college freshmen and senior citizens. And if you think about it, they have a lot in common. They're moving into a new environment. Access to family is re relatively lower than it's ever been. And in many cases, in absolute terms, is low and or zero. Um, they're learning new rules. They're learning a, a new way of life. Um, and um, what researchers have discovered already, and this is across, there's been multiple studies that have shown this, is that when you put a smart speaker into a college dorm room of a freshman or into a room belonging to a senior citizen in a senior living facility or even uh, living at home, miraculous things start to take place. College freshmen become more participatory in their environment. College freshmen um, attend class more, make better grades, drop out less, and kill themselves less. Senior citizens living in senior living facilities, more participatory in their communities, um, less depressed, more um, adherent to their drug regimens, uh, more compliant with uh, the drugs they're supposed to be taking, and they die less. And the, the, the causality of it is still being debated, but the correlation is so strong that we know that this is, there's something profound here. Um, I'll cover these last two uh, relatively briefly. I'm trying to keep an eye on time as well and be respectful of your time. So speech pathology and project understood. So all along with smart speakers and voice assistants, we have discovered that children who have access to smart speakers, um, they speak better. They speak clearer. Um, their word choice is better, but the main thing is they speak clearer and enunciate themselves clearer. And what's really interesting about this is that um, people who have speech impediments, you know, like I did growing up, you go to a speech therapist and you work through it, but having access to a smart speaker, the smart speaker couldn't care less if you're trying hard to say the words, but you say it, you say it again, you say it again, you say it again, a little bit better each time and talking to Alexa, talking to Google Assistant helps improve um, whatever speech challenge you have. And what Project Understood is, and we're so fortunate that, to have had Project Understood come to Project Voice and come to Chattanooga earlier this year, Project Understood is the joint venture between Google and the Canadian Down Syndrome Society where they have worked together to make Google Smart Speakers and Google Assistant um, more capable of understanding people who have Down syndrome as a result of this machine learning process they put into place where people with Down syndrome can participate in that and, and contribute data to that that makes it better. The last thing I'm going to mention here is Canary Speech and Carnegie Mellon. So uh, Canary Speech, uh, their entire business is taking data from your voice. And I don't mean the words out of your mouth, I mean the, the sound and uh, all that latent data that's in, in the sound of your voice. And they can, they've already gotten to where they can predict um, and even diagnose certain types of disease based on simply hearing your voice. It's crazy. And Carnegie Mellon made national news just a couple of months ago for putting together a COVID-19 test, which um, you speak into a voice assistant and it compares your voice and the, the attributes of your voice to hundreds of thousands of people, um, you know, in, including tens of thousands, I think at that point, cases that had had COVID-19. And they were able to give you, you know, a probability that you had COVID-19. Now, this was not approved by anybody or any sort of governmental entity, but now it shows where we're going. So I'll touch on this, and then we can open up to Q&A. You know, next steps for 
you know, in the wake of this pandemic we're in and, and where we're at with voice, you're going to be hearing you know, a whole lot about no touch technology. And it's far more than just voice. There'll be biometrics, there'll be face ID, there'll be all this, all sorts of stuff. But voice will have a critical role to play in sort of making the world more hygienic and making the world um, more safe, you know, more healthy. Um, and uh, that in and of itself is an, is an accessibility story. Um, if we make our world a safer place uh, to, to venture out into, uh, that's really fundamental. And then the importance of authentication and security. So really the, a, a big next step for voice is um, Alexa and Google Assistant are pretty good. Uh, they've got functionality built into where they can tell you, you know, who you are and they can recognize your voice. But um, there's a whole other frontier out there of companies that are working to constantly imitate your voice. And uh, there's valid reasons for that that are not criminal in nature. Um, you know, there's musicians and there's there's audiobook narrators and there's a lot of people in media and entertainment fields, among many others, where, you know, maybe you went into the studio to record an audiobook and you recorded it and then you went went on your merry way. And then the engineer two days later finds out, oh, there's a there's a problem with chapter nine. They don't want to bring you back into the studio for that. They just want to have a, a spoof of your voice. And um, and there's companies working on that. And then there's companies working on the exact opposite, which is taking two voices, a real one and a fake one, and telling you which one's which and uh, using some really sophisticated technology to determine what's real and what's fake in this world. Um, so it's super interesting. So this is me. I'm on Twitter at bmetrock. Uh, my email address is here. I, I, I welcome hearing from you. I would love to hear from you. I'm going to leave this up for about 10 more seconds. Um, I, I encourage anybody who's listened to this and found it even remotely interesting to reach out. So with that, we'll open it up to whatever questions we got. Yeah, thank you so much, Bradley. That was a really um, informative presentation. And like you said, we'll be opening the floor up to questions now. So please put those in if you'd like um, any feedback and we'll just go ahead and discuss. We have until um, 3.15. So we've got some time to discuss any questions um, and, and anything that's gone into this session. Um, the first question that I'm seeing here is, uh, you know, voice technology, like you mentioned, has moved so fast um, and we're seeing things like Project Understood. Um, can we go into that a little bit and and potentially see how to get involved with things like that? How, you know, maybe on the user side, um, we can give back to projects uh, that are on the forefront of technology. Sure. Yeah. So um, with Project Understood and anything like Project yeah. Understood, where there's an effort on behalf of technology companies, to improve their service, improve the product. They need data and they need people to provide it. And um, that can look like a lot of different things, but for Project Understood, there was an open call for people who have Down syndrome to participate in this process by which I think you read a hundred sentences out loud. Um, if you have Down syndrome, they, they send you this list or you have access to this list and you read these sentences and they ingest, you know, Google ingests all this data that people contribute. And um, the result is that their, their data scientists and their engineers are able to improve um, the core voice assistant. I'm not certain if that is still open. I would invite people to check. Um, and if you want to email me, I'm happy to put you in contact with the Canadian Down Syndrome Society. Um, or Google themselves um, to if you if you are interested in contributing to that. Um, that's far from the only example of this. Uh, there there are currently and will be many others uh, because voice. It's it's clear that not everybody's going to interact with technology through voice all the time. Right. It's not it's not voice only. <laughs> it's it's voice, we call it voice first, but whether you agree with that or not, voice will sit along a lot of other modalities with how we interact with technology. So if you want to get the QWERTY keyboard out and the mouse, uh, be my guest. 
But a lot of people will choose to interact with computers moving forward with voice. And the more people that that world is open to, the better off we're all going to be. Right. And and going into that um, a little bit more, uh, especially for people with disabilities, um, having the option to not use that QWERTY keyboard, um, if they're not able to, um, opens up a lot of possibilities. What kind of things do we see in like the realm of smart homes and that type of thing that could open doors for individuals that aren't able to interact in a way that um, most of us can? Well, I, I'll tell you, it's, I wouldn't necessarily call it a smart home uh, application, but uh, I'll tell you about something that you'll find interesting. I, um, and it's definitely an accessibility story as well. I, you know, if I wanted to list 10 slides worth of accessibility stories, like that one that I had, I could. Mm -hmm. And if I did, one that would be on there is that science just from the, I've been working with Harvard as well, but I know MIT folks are involved, have created a headset. And this is wild. This is worth Googling if you're interested in this after this is over, um, or I'm happy to send you a link to it, uh, information about it. They've created this headset, and it looks like something that a person in a call center would wear, um, or somebody on Xbox Live, or something like that. Where it's 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 headset with with a with a mic with a little bit of a mic, um, and what it does um, is it, in essence, allows you to speak without speaking. And I'm going to try to be as specific on this as I can because I'm only beginning to understand this technology. They put this thing on your head, and it's a combination of the way the 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 the, uh, the skull works and the muscles. And uh, I don't know how much reading brain waves is is involved. Look, I can't explain to you technology. All I can say is that it will re it basically, in essence, reads your mind. And it's, wow. not exaggeration. it's not an exaggeration at all. Uh, in fact, I'm probably underselling the technology, if anything. So if you're not able to speak, um, first of all, if you're able to move your lips, but you know, no sound comes out, they have lip reading technology so that this wouldn't be necessary for folks in that basket. But if you can't do any of that and you don't have muscle control, um, but you have your mental faculties, mm -hmm. what MIT has created will in the future and, and currently allow you to communicate with the world. Um, and it's it's crazy. So I encourage, I don't even know what they call that. Um, it has a name, but if you search for MIT mind reading <laughs> or something like that, you will find your way there. And it's, um, that's just the next step, you know, um, Voice, and that's really the bottom line here, or a bottom line for sure, is that when you think about voice technology, it's easy to get caught up in privacy. So that, like I said, that's a totally separate conversation. We're always going to have it. We're never going to stop having that conversation ever. Um, but where we are now is that Echo devices and Google devices and Siri and this, that, and the other, a lot of it is just Q&A. Mm -hmm. Ask a question. I get an answer back. I ask another question, what's the weather? What's the weather, uh, Google? I get an answer back. Very soon, I'm talking, I mean, if it wasn't for the pandemic, it might've been by the end of this year, maybe with everything accelerating, maybe because of the pandemic, it'll be by the end of the year. Certainly into 2021, we will be at a point where these voice assistants are way beyond that. And it'll be things like, um, Wesley, I saw that you're going on a trip two weeks up to the Smoky Mountains. Um, you're going to be there for four days. Uh, you just listened to this podcast with this author on it. Uh, and we saw as well that you bought that author's book a couple of years ago. Do you want us to go ahead and buy uh, that author's new book, which just came out last week, and we know you didn't know about it because you didn't never search for it. Uh, go ahead and buy it and either ship it to you or have it shipped directly to the uh, resort you'll be staying at. Um, crazy. Con very context-driven stuff will be the next step. Wow. Uh, and um, and then we'll just continue to see new uh, evolutions of both software and hardware, sort of like the MIT thing I just talked about, uh, come forth as well. So it's an exciting future. It's a brave new world. Um, and it's worth sitting here and talking about.
is really exciting. Um, and I know that I could jump into that and, and pursue that, but I want to get to some of these other questions. Um, we have one here. How does Google Recorder transcription work without cloud access? Is it done connecting a Google Puck device to a laptop? It's basically, um, no, no, it's not. It's all done just on device. So there's no extra device needed or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. I think the first device that's, ha that's had that introduced is the latest Google Pixel phone, Google Pixel 3. I'm not sure what which one it is. But, um, and they'll start rolling it out to some other devices. But essentially, they've they've shrunk the code down necessary to, to do that um, to such a, a, a microscopic extent that they're able to uh, embed that functionality in uh, newer devices that are getting manufactured. And, um, you know, I'm sure the implications of that, that it, are it doesn't recognize everything. But I can tell you from experience, current transcription connected to the cloud doesn't recognize everything either. So, um, you know, it, it's it's a bold new step and it's it's something that you, you hear it and it may not resonate right away that that's an accessibility case, but but it definitely is and it will only get better over time. Right, um, and, and so digging into that a little bit, um, what kinds of ways do you see that um, cloudless um, you know, transcription work, how will that be beneficial to people with disabilities? Um, what are the, you know, practical implications of that? Um, and how will that be utilized? Well, you know, I think um, uh, once once more people know that it exists, I think it could be used in a lot of different and exciting ways. I think, um, you know, if you've got, um, you know, Google Recorder both, it, it, it transcribes as well as it might be at this point already, if not as close, it translates. Mm -hmm. And so um, the combination of both of those, the fact that it does not require an internet connection, um, you know, maybe we're not talking um, the most robust physical accessibility case here. Maybe this is more of a financial accessibility case. Although I think there's plenty of physical accessibility scenarios that could come out of it. But, um, you know, when you think of accessibility in terms of people of all sorts of different walks of life with all sorts of different conditions and constraints and, and things around them, um, you know, something like Google Recorder uh, will only help. Um, and in terms of specific use cases, you know, I, I guess I would imagine, you know, um, it would be nice to not have to have an internet connection and be able to record um, audio and have it transcribed so that if somebody is deaf uh, in the family, you know, they could be more participatory and any number of things going on, you know, um, that's at least where I would start. Right, and I can imagine, I mean, I know here in Tennessee and then across the world, there's areas where an internet connection isn't always secure. It's not always uh, viable and that, like you're saying, it could be expensive to have that. So um, I can imagine that um, having access to something that you don't need internet access to would open a world of uh, functionality for someone that might be using their smart device or their, in, you know, in their home without needing that internet connection. Sure. Uh, another question we have here. Are most of these new voice programs being developed with English speaking areas or is it being driven more from non-English regions like Asia? So yeah, it's a great question. So um, there's no doubt that a lot of the innovation is coming out of the United States. Um, with Alexa, you saw the, the graph I showed uh, about US smart speaker market share. Um, Silicon Valley and the United States is really pushing the ball forward, but there's plenty of meaningful innovation going on across the world. Um, there's both Alexa and Google Assistant rushing into other geographies. I think uh, Alexa is available in 30 countries now at this point, somewhere around there. Uh, and Google Assist is a little bit behind, probably around 15 to 20. Um, but when you look at something like 
um, there's a voice assistant in India. And uh, I would get the name wrong, even if I remembered what, what it was. But basically what this voice assistant does in India is, it, see, in India, a lot of people have, um, I don't know if I, uh, I don't know what, a, a, uh, they have phones that are not full on smartphones. They're more of the way phones used to be, where it's just like an actual phone. It's not, the computing power is, is much less. And um, you know, a lot of them are flip phones, but not all of them. But anyway, uh, in India, they have figured out how to layer on a voice assistant with a lot of these basic phones. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they will use it to order food. Now, I, um, uh, imagine this, being able to order food through your phone, through voice, and say a lot of it's produce, that's the number one type of food ordered through this. Uh, you know, I want um, 10 pounds of bananas and throw in some oranges and, you know, bring me some some vegetables, you know, bring me some tomatoes. <clears throat> and someone in India who's, uh, they, they source those orders out to a number of farmers and local markets. Somebody gets on a bike and they bring you the food. You didn't pay for it. They're just bringing you the food. And uh, and then they give it to you, and then later they hope you pay for it. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of it's COD, you know, cash on delivery, but they'll bring it to you even if you don't pay in the moment. They'll uh, just allow you to owe them. We would never, ever do that in the United States. And the okay. point uh, that, that I'm making there is that there are significant cultural differences that we are already seeing on how voice and AI are being integrated across the world. And uh, there's many other examples of it I could go into. Uh, obviously, it goes without saying, some countries uh, are more concerned about privacy uh, because their governments have violated them a little bit more uh, flagrantly than others. Um, there's a lot of different dynamics with that. Um, and it's worth, you know, like I said, if, it, if it's interesting, it's worth sort of looking into. And voicebot.ai, that website where that graphic came from is a good place to start. Great. Yeah. And it's, it'll be interesting to see um, how some of those different motivations drive innovation differently. I know you talked about competition really driving innovation here. Um, but, but given that, you know, say voice technology is being used primarily to deliver groceries, um, you know, it's, it'll be in other countries, it'll be interesting to see um, how that affects the innovation that they, you know, have for their specific market. And then you know, merging those things, I'm sure, uh, will open some doors in the future. Sure. Uh, something that I wanted to mention, I'd forgotten to, um, if you have a question, um, but you'd like to use a video relay service for that, if you require ASL, we do have um, an, an individual standing by, um, and you can call a number for that. That number is 423-298-2489. I just wanted to mention that we've got uh, about 10 more minutes of question time here. Um, another question we have is what work is being done for individuals using augmented communication devices to interact with voice technology? Hmm. Uh, uh, augmented communication device. What, what do you mean? Or what does that person mean? Any idea? Is that a is that a technical term? I you know I'm not sure. I, I think that it would probably be um, because what I, yeah what I might I mean I think what I just got done talking about this MIT mind reading right. device is probably the the upper end example of that. Um, you know, let me think about that a minute. Um, I've I did mention just a moment ago lip reading. So um, it's not an augmented communication device that you would wear, but it's an augmented communication layer of functionality built into the smart speaker, either the hardware or the voice system itself, where there's several companies, and you see this a little bit in, in the car, um, some healthcare examples of this, where there is uh, lip reading. And um, 
you know, the the hardware is not listening uh, so much to you as as it's reading the words coming out of your mouth, as well as in some cases your your um, emotional state and evaluating sort of sentiment analysis and. Um, it enables it to sort of get to a place where it can help you a little bit more. And I saw where someone in the chat wrote what they meant about communication. Yeah. Communication. I think a AAC device uh, you may be familiar with, or, or just someone who is unable to speak using a device um, that may not be able to form words. So it would be something similar to what you're referring to. Yeah. For if, if they can't, if someone cannot speak, um, and it's it's they they can't control any muscles to to where lip reading would help them. Then um, I don't know what all exists. I'm not going to pretend to be encyclopedic, but I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, you need to go Google this MIT technology I was talking about and get in touch with those researchers because um, that is exactly what the doctor ordered. Um, and, and you think about somebody like Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. um, if that. I believe that the researchers who started this project did so because of Stephen Hawking, but um, it would have changed his life uh, if it had been further along. But uh, just to echo what I said earlier, please go check that out if that's a concern or if that's something that, that you're dealing with. Great. Uh, another question we have here, uh, what are the largest barriers to future development in voice technology? I know we talked a lot about the innovation and the competition that drives that, but what are some of those barriers yeah. um, that we're seeing? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna give you something that I, th I don't think you expect on this. I mean, I could certainly talk about privacy uh, and I did talk about privacy. I could talk about uh, any number of, of things that have been out in the media, but one I will mention that really has not gotten discussed very much at all is the political nature of these voice assistants. So with This Week in Voice, the, the show on this banner behind me, uh, our flagship show, we've covered multiple stories um, related to voice assistants, and it's primarily the mainstream ones, Alexa and Google Assistant, Siri, um, saying something that made people mad. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you two examples. A couple of years ago, Somebody and this is somebody in Nashville who made national news for doing this. Um, decided to ask Alexa, "Who is Jesus Christ?" And mm -hmm. Alexa gave an answer um, that this gentleman found very unacceptable, and set off this whole fiasco of negative news coverage. And what did Amazon do? They went into the lab. They changed it immediately within 72 hours later uh it had a definition coming straight out of wikipedia and it was that episode that led them to connect more questions like that to wikipedia uh than they had done at that point it was the next year that somebody came along um and i forget who this was uh but it wasn't the same person someone completely different who is hillary clinton and it gave some <laughs> nasty answer. I don't remember what it said exactly. And people were all upset, all in an uproar again. And so they did the same thing. They go back into the lab and they change uh, what Alexa said about Hillary Clinton. And that was a scenario where uh, what was being said about Hillary Clinton was tied to Wikipedia, but someone had altered Wikipedia gotcha. <laughs> and, and made it say uh, whatever it said. So to me, a, a really underrated, under the radar threat to voice assistants, conversational AI, smart speakers, any of this technology is the politics of our society to where if, if your computer tells you something you don't like, then by God, you're gonna stop using it. And it's that's just the way a lot of our culture works and i think that as we go along these things become more useful you start having longer conversations with your technology sort of like what i've alluded to in this presentation that that risk of politics creeping into it becomes more and more of a threat it's something to keep an eye on that we've seen just the initial um start to but something i think will become more and more of a factor moving forward right and i'm, I'm sure that um 
you know, it's, it's impossible to get rid of some of those concerns just due to the subject subjectivity of all of us. That's right. Um, how, how we all interact differently with, with life. And I think that we'll see technology um, being catered more and more and, and maybe taking that into consideration, hopefully. Um, but something else that I saw in the chat here that was interesting, um, somebody who had mentioned the AAC devices, going back to that, um, said that they have actually had success with people using AAC devices with, say, phrases such as Alexa, turn on the lights. Um, this can be saved as a button or command they can easily tab and generate with enough speed that most voice assistants recognize it and obey. So I guess that would be like further furthering that discussion of an augmented device using a technological voice that can be recognized by these voice technologies um, and helping individuals with disabilities. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. Yeah, and it's a great example. And I'll throw on top of that, um, there's a number of diseases that human beings get where you can completely lose your voice. Not like I have to tell this audience this, um, but um, I certainly didn't know much about it. Um, and there's companies, uh, one, of, one of my favorite companies is called Vocal ID, and they're based out of Boston. And what they do is if you know that you're losing your voice for whatever reason it, it is, they work with you and they record your voice. Um, and I'm selling them short here, I'm paraphrasing all this. Uh, I, I welcome you to check them out. But they, they record your voice basically and you're saying a lot of stuff such that they can uh, create a computerized version of your voice that sounds like you. Most people wouldn't think it's you. Hmm. Um, and uh, that enables these individuals content to continue to speak with their own voice after they have lost their original voice. And it's really interesting. Um, and it's an, it's just another accessibility win as well. But uh, I would throw that onto the, what was in the comments as well as something to pay attention to.